Oh, okay, everybody. I guess we are live. You guys catch me looking at the other screen. How about that for your first uh, intro into the show today? Oops. Um, anyway, welcome to the Office 365 Pulse. Um, you guys should be seeing on the screen our sway for the day. Um, so this is out here. You guys should be able to see it. We have a awesome special guest today. Uh, Tanya is our guest. Um, so she should be starting um, starting her webcam any minute to join us um, for uh, the presentation today. Tanya is one of my uh, wonderful coworkers at Planet. She has been um, a friend of mine actually when I was interviewing for Planet and I was talking to Scott and different things like that. I had totally forgot that Tasha even worked at Planet. And it was so funny, at one point he asked me, he's like, do you know Tasha Scott? And I was like, yeah, I talk to her every morning on Twitter. Um, and we started laughing because that's kind of how I know Tasha. We're both, I guess, very active on Twitter, so we talk about recipes and beer and vacation and everything almost every morning. So I get up and see what Tasha's doing. So I've known her for several uh, years in the community. She is a great... Um, yeah, I'm calling her Tanya. It's Tasha. How about you just... Yeah, I'm sorry, y'all. It happens. <laughs> what the heck? See, you guys can just tell I'm having an off day. Like, the camera starts and I'm looking at a different screen and answering emails. I'm telling you. Okay, starting over. It's Tasha. I was like, something doesn't sound right. Anyway, uh, Tasha, why don't you give us, like, a little intro to you and, and tell us how awesome you are. Yeah, so uh, I, I guess I am fairly active on Twitter. So if you're on Twitter, you can find me at at Tasha's Ev. T-A-S-H-A-S-E-B, um, and yeah, you'll, you'll see me there quite a bit. Um, I'm a SharePoint consultant. I've been doing SharePoint consulting since 2009, and as, uh, as Jen said, um, I've been active in the community, so if, you, if I look familiar, although that, that bowl picture maybe not so <laughs> I can't really go out in public with a bowl on my head. Um, but you may have seen me at a SharePoint Saturday or at SharePoint Conference or um, even at TechEd. I was at TechEd for a few years helping Ineta out with the Birds of a Feather sessions, and that was great. Um, I've run a SharePoint user group in the past, and I'm currently co-organizing .NET DC as my latest community venture. Um, and I love beer and cooking, as Jen said, and also gaming. I'm I'm a gamer. I love me an RPG game. <laughs> I, I did not know that you were a gamer. I knew beer and I knew food, but I hadn't uh, I, I hadn't known you were a gamer. So fun stuff. Fun stuff. Well, thank you for joining us today. I'm excited yeah. to get to talk about a day in the life with you a little bit. Um, later in the show, but first we have all of the updates for what has rolled in the last uh, approximately two weeks with Office 365. So I'm going to um, come over here and let's see, show you guys some of the updates that we have. So uh, nothing too major, major um, this week. One change that they've made is the way that Word documents and uh, live co-authoring works. So live co-authoring, they're kind of uh, rolling out in batches. And so it used to be if you had a, a document stored, stored in SharePoint and you opened it up um, with someone, you could do live editing. So you see the cursor live. It's, it's editing the document. Now you can do that with documents that are stored in OneDrive. So that's kind of expanded into OneDrive. I'm assuming we'll start to see it with more than Word documents and we'll start to see it kind of falling all over the place pretty quickly. Uh, but that's the major change there. That really should not have any impact on anyone um, too much, but it's one of the changes that's out there. The next set of changes, though, is a fun set of changes. And I don't know that these are necessarily changes as much as they are um, the new world that we live in. And so um, one of the next, uh, I guess, uh, 
sections we have in the sway is talking about SharePoint 2016. So the much awaited SharePoint 2016 has rolled out and I think one of the things that is causing people the the largest piece of confusion and concern right now is if you look at the features that are no longer available um, Excel services is gone so I think this one is pretty interesting with InfoPath they uh, are leaving InfoPath in there for many generations of you know SharePoint to come to make sure things upgrade and things run smoothly and you know we're gonna get new tools eventually I was actually joking with somebody about it that we're gonna get new tools in the fall uh, we're just not sure what fall that is because the first time they told us it was the summer and they said it was coming so we're two falls later and maybe this fall next fall the next fall we might start to see some of those tools but with Excel services they just took them away and they've moved everything to Excel online. Um, so if you're running an on-prem environment, you would have to have Office Online Server running on-prem to get the features. Mouthful. That's a great name there. Uh, but you should be able to use those there, and then you should be able to get everything done that you could do inside of Excel services now just using Excel Online as the back end. Um, and so we see here they keep pushing out new things that are available in Excel 2016 to make it a richer experience. And I think that coincides directly with the announcement that Excel is um, or Excel services are no longer in SharePoint 2016. Um, at this point, I don't think that there's a cause for an alarm yet. I think it's still waiting to see and figure out what's happening. I don't know what's going to happen with upgrades. So if someone's using a bunch of the Excel services uh, web parts, I don't know what's going to happen um, when they upgrade. I think that there's probably some people uh, doing some research about that. I've got some questions out there, but I haven't got any answers. The first time I told a group of people this um, was last week at SP TechCon, right when it came out, and we went over what had been removed. And I, I think some people were ready to cry, and I felt very, very sad for them because, you know, they're using Excel services and they're like, well, crap, now what? So, Tasha, have you seen a lot of people use Excel services or have you seen it widely adopted in the world that's out there? Yeah, I'm. I'm actually pretty interested to see. Being that right now, my I'm in the trenches with project server stuff. Um, Excel services is used for the reporting parts of project wow. server on prem. So I'm. I'm really interested to see what that means for project server installs and how that's going to work for reporting. Yeah, that's. I, I think there's a lot of unknowns, and I'm. I'm surprised that the framework isn't still part of the server so that things don't break. Um, surely things are not going to break. Like, that's that's my <laughs> mind. I'm thinking, surely they're not. <laughs> like, I just go back to the days where you have to, like, and this is this is talking. This is not what's actually happened. But I go back to those days where you used to run those upgrade checkers and it would come back and tell you everything that wasn't going to upgrade. And I'm just thinking of oh crap, like what is not going to upgrade or what's not going to work and like I said, I don't think there's cause for alarm yet because I haven't seen any clear answers out. Uh, the only thing that I've really seen from Microsoft is that hey, uh, Excel Online can do everything that you were going to do that Excel Web Services could do um, and hey, it's going to work and then the Excel team is coming out and just like pimping their new hey, here are all of our new things, and here's all the great things that we could do, and life is happy together. So maybe it's just one of those things that will collide and work together perfectly, but I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what that means for upgrade yet and different things like that. So I'm trying to dig into it, but I haven't been able to find um, any super great answers yet, but I surely they're not going to roll something out that's going to break everything. So I, I, I don't know. <laughs> Using um, trusted data connections or trusted libraries, you really need to pay attention to that space because yes. I don't know what that looks like yet or what that story is going to be yet. Right. And they have a really powerful BI story, right? So Power BI and Power View and all of these things, and they're getting a really great story, just not sure all the pieces connect yet into something that makes perfect sense. So we'll find out. 
We will, and we will let you guys know as soon as we know more of the details, we will be sharing them with you guys. I'm trying to um, dig in. Like I've said, I've sent a couple of um, emails out. I'm finding some uber technical uh, information about it, but as I'm going through and I'm thinking, well, what about this scenario and what about that scenario? I want to make sure that from a business perspective, we understand what is that going to do to my reports? What do I need to do now? What do I? And so I'm trying to figure out some of those pieces. Um, everything I've seen coming from Excel and coming from all of the the new BI features, they look like awesome features. So I'm not um, too upset by the change as long as some of the things uh, will still work. So I think it's you know more to, more to come on this. But for now, we're just kind of watching. Um, Excel will work better. So um, Excel 2016 for the Mac has got some really great uh, changes for how you can work with external data. Um, and then there's also things like uh, PowerView um, and different things like, like that. And so just in the last two weeks, um, Excel posted three different um, they posted three different blog posts about updates and so that shows that they're pushing out a lot of content so I think we just kinda have to keep watching for it so if anybody is a big Excel user uh, don't worry yet but become uh, I guess Excel services don't worry yet but become very aware of what's going on so a couple of things so you can plan for it so you can ask the right questions and so you can make your voice heard if whatever answers they're giving you are going to mess you up, then you can get on user voice and you can get on the Yammer network and you can be like, hey, this isn't cool. Um, so we'll keep working on an information. Go ahead, talk. Go ahead, Tasha. If you are listening to the user voice, um, put, your, put your thoughts there because they do hear you and they are responding. Yes, yes. And this is IT, IT preview, IT tech preview. Um, so it's one of the early previews. So we have seen in the past where they've put some things out and then they've uh, backpedaled a little bit and changed their stance on some things. And so we'll just kind of have to uh, keep going through it and seeing. Um, I'd also say one of the most excellent places to get information or to come with very specific questions is on the um, the tech talk, the IT tech talk that Bill does with um, IT Unity. So um, Lyman and Eric, I know you guys are in the chat room. If you can let me know when the next one is, I'll kind of uh, promote that out a little bit. But people can uh, come online and submit questions and stuff like that. They have previous ones recorded as well. So you can um, come get it. It looks like the next episode is on the 11th. Um, but you can log in, answer, uh, get your questions answered, and then you can also watch the previous recordings. Um, they're all available on IT Unity, so some great resources for you if you have specific questions about that. That'll be more from the IT Pro standpoint, but um, probably right now the best. Um, you want to talk about getting information about a beta. If you want to get it from the source, uh, Bill's the best source to get it from. So you can read blogs and articles and stuff like that, but if you want to get as close to the source as you can, that's a great um a great opportunity to do that. So with that being said, the next one that we have on our list is the SharePoint 2016 um, technical preview. So they highlighted a few things. I guess the, the easiest way to talk about it is that you can um, go in and you can see the changes that they made are about making Office 365 a better um, or making SharePoint 2016 on-prem a better experience based on what they've learned from running uh, SharePoint in the cloud through Office 365. So we're at several years of Office 365 now. They've learned a lot as they've been trying to take uh, SharePoint online, run it in the cloud, get it going through a hybrid environment, doing a lot of these different pieces. And so what we're seeing is a refreshed version of SharePoint 2016 that implements a lot of these changes as well as makes for a easier hybrid experience. Um, so a couple of things that just make me happy when I look at it, that would be number six on the list, large file support. So thank you. We want something bigger than a two gigabyte file. Um, some of the other things, App Launcher, that's been in Office 365 for a long time now, so we're going to be able to see that in the on-prem version. 
And then a lot of the other things are uh, very back-end focused. So they're very much making a better overall experience by going at the foundational level. So uh, Tasha, have you done anything with 2016 yet? Um, I, I downloaded the preview and I haven't s installed it yet, but that's actually on my list to do this week. We started putting together the back-end bits last week um, just to get up uh, our own play environment. Yep. And yeah, it'll be good times, but I am excited. Yeah, Everybody um, has said so far that you know their installation experience has been okay. I've heard a couple of, of things, but um, once you get all the prerequisite stuff, that it's it's usually all right. We'll see. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I haven't actually done the install. Um, Corey did it, and so I've seen some of the stuff that he's done. I kind of live, you know, I live with my help desk, so why would I install a server when he can? It just doesn't make sense. So, <laughs> um, fun. so I, I actually helped out with like um, creating the um, servers and the V, you know, the VMs. Um, yeah, I'm getting my hands dirty with that stuff. Yeah, we actually, um, so Corey was installing it, you know, putting it on VMs and stuff like that, and we have a uh, no no games, no video games policy with our kids during the week. And so it was Monday, and I was collecting all of their devices, and I turned off my son's laptop and put it in, you know, put it in the bin, like, okay, it's off for the week. You can have it back on Friday. And Corey's like, what happened to this, you know, what happened to the laptop? Because it turns out he ran it on my son's um, laptop that was sitting upstairs. He's like, I need that connected. That's where 2016 is. And I was like, okay, well, information you should have told me before I just started unplugging things. But we kind of got, um, we kind of got a kick out of that. And so he came home and he's like, why are you guys using my laptop? And so ah. we're like, well, we needed a spare box, you know. So it was on so hosting SharePoint. You don't know that, but you yeah. are. <laughs> Which That's is awesome. Fun. Why not, right? You borrow from your kids. Yeah, Dan said he thinks that our kids have two powerful laptops, and that is the truth. Um, but when we get new laptops, it's like, do I go buy them a little kit? You know, do I buy them a laptop that's acceptable for them, or do I use this free overpowered one that's sitting here? Um, so we go with the free overpowered one, and then we lock it down with cables so they can't move it. So it's like the laptop that they can't move unless they have a key. Um, and so <laughs> they're not allowed to actually travel with them, but they have them. So it's kind of, uh, we kind of laugh about that. We might be a device-heavy house. Um, why not, you know? Why not? Yeah, it works. Um, so there's also a list of some of the things that are no longer in um, SharePoint 2016. Uh, SharePoint, uh, SharePoint Foundation is one of them. So there is no more... Uh, SharePoint Foundation that uh, goes away with the last version of SharePoint. Uh, there's no more standalone install mode, which is good. I can't think of a single time where that is the right way to install anyway. So no more standalone install. Uh, Forefront Identity Manager is uh, gone. That's no longer supported. There's other ways to do it um, with some of the Active Directory syncs and different things like that. So there's different ways to handle the same thing. And then Excel services inside of SharePoint is gone, but it's technically being replaced with uh, Excel Online. And there was also some BI stuff that was mentioned there, so I think there's going to be more of a story as it gets closer, uh, but it's definitely, um, definitely there. So I put the links there if you guys are interested um, in digging into it. I'd say right now there's a flurry of information. Um, I'd still stick pretty close to Microsoft. Um, for data right now or people that are very trusted uh, resources like I know at um, IT Unity, Dan and them have been checking um, checking the data and getting things, trying to get things out there that are really valuable and I think it's still pretty early. We're about a week, um, a week or so into the preview being available so you're going to start to see some really good feedback coming, um, coming quickly. So um, that's that. Tasha will have to have you back once you get get it all installed and you can tell us all about. I I debated doing a, a session about it very quickly and I was like, we need to wait a couple of weeks until things kind of die down and we actually have definitive data um, to share with people or to show. Um, like 
from my understanding right now, if you look at it, it looks exactly like SharePoint uh, 2010. Oh, good piece, or 2013. Good piece yeah. of news, though. They did not move the site actions from one side of the screen to the other. It stayed the same. And so I'm not sure that, I mean, that's how I know what version we're working on, right? Like, it moves left to right every version release. Um, so this this time it stayed the same. Maybe that's something that will change by the time it actually rolls out. But for now, site actions remain in the same spot. So um, it's kind of funny, I think. But we'll see. We'll see if it starts to move. Um, <laughs> all right. The next piece we have is Outlook um, on iOS. So when you've got a... Um, when we've got a document um, on your phone or different things like that, there used to be uh, viewers that would pop up instead of actually popping up in the native client. So they've made some improvements that basically if you're in Outlook and you have an attachment and you open up a PowerPoint attachment, it's going to take you into PowerPoint to open it versus this in-between uh, viewer. And so that is a big help. It's also if you're um, on the phone or something and you say, I want to send, I'm in a document and I want to send it to someone, it's going to open it in the Outlook client um, and do it as an attachment. And then if I'm in a document, um, let's say Tasha sends me a document, I open it on my phone, I'm editing and making changes. When I hit the back button, it's going to go back to the uh, email and send it as a um, send it as a, a an attachment with my changes. So a much better experience if you're working with documents or anything like that on iOS. Um, coming to Android in the next several months, it said, but it's, I don't know that I use feature improvements. I think I call these uh, making the Outlook clients where I actually want to use it because it behaves the way I expect it to behave. Um, so they've got some of those um, rolling out there. So um, I see a question that came into the booth, so I want to make sure that we answer it. Um, and he was saying, was the co-authoring referring to OneDrive um, or OneDrive for Business? I believe it's both um, for the co-authoring for Word. So I believe it's both um, that it's out there for now. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Take a breath. <laughs> I feel like I'm talking very fast. Um, which anyone who knows me knows that I do talk very fast all of the time. Um, <laughs> so we have two more things um, to mention um, that are coming out. The first one is that there is a reInvent productivity web series that's coming out. Um, I, it's pretty much for the month of September. It's at like 10 a.m., 45 minutes, like every Tuesday or every Thursday. I'm not sure of the exact date. Um, and it's a group of Microsoft folks that are doing sessions about how you can use Office 365 to be more productive um, in your day-to-day. -day. So one person that I recognize on the list was uh, Michael Gennady, and he is just amazing. So he's got some great content and information, and I know if he is part of this series, then it's going to be just an excellent series. So it's very focused on getting more done. It's Office 365 heavy. Um, they talk about how they're doing so many different um, they're doing so many different things um, and making so many different changes to Office 365 that it really allows us to reinvent how we can be productive in how we work. And so they're going to do some quick 45-minute sessions to show off some of those productivity tools. So it might be something good to watch and in the background have everybody, you know, have it going on in the background when people are working and you might pick up some tips and tricks. I believe they're also going to have it recorded so it's something you could catch up with um, later. So there's links there if you're interested in registering um, for that and seeing all the pieces that are there. So, um, I don't know, it's, it, sometimes they're awesome, sometimes they're not, So, but I think it's totally worth um, letting you guys know that it's there. And then the last one that came out is one that I just think is awesome. Um, and what this is, is it's the Microsoft Legal is running a homegrown system called the, Ma the Matter Center. 
Um, and what this does is this is a combination of pulling the best of all worlds together, but using the tools that they're already used to. So like Office, Excel, PowerPoint, Word documents, but pulling them together in a combined way that allows you to access the data better in a very specific um, way for legal departments. And so they're making this available on GitHub where you can go in, see all of the components, and then you can jump in and do this. I know a couple of people at Planet I was talking to have been involved and have done some uh, Matter Center implementations. And then I was talking to a few folks online that are kind of looking into it. It appears right now that it goes across Azure, Office 365, a couple of different components. Um, Tasha, have you done anything with Matter Center yet? I have not. It's that new. Yeah, this one I think just hit yesterday or the day before. And I'm really excited that they made it available. It's the ultimate example of eating your own dog food. But I think it's going to show us how we can get um, how we can get more out of the tools that we already have and might even get us some inside um, inside information um, from different pieces. So Dan just commented and he says he thinks you might have to get it from partners um, and that may be the case. Um, I haven't totally seen it. So my plan for this one was to wait until things died down, find out where I could get it, and go see some more information. I thought it would be great on a show to do an actual demo of it um, so we can see how these things come together because even if it's used in legal firms, it might be of value to other places as well. Um, so I'm going to try to do some more research on that. But like I said, it just hit the blogs in the last day or so. Um, so I'm going to have to do some digging on it. Um, Guy Johnson also asked a question about, um, I'm sorry, not Guy, John Wagner asked a question about the file size upload um, for 2016. Um, it's my understanding right now that it's going to be 10, uh, 10 gigabytes. Um, and so that's what it's looking at least for now that the max file size will be 10 gigabytes, which is uh, definitely better than two. So we're, we're getting there. Um, so awesome. So thanks for posting the questions if you guys have them. Uh, feel free to keep doing it. I try to check over, click over, and see um, uh, see what's over there. So very cool stuff. This is all kind of the updates that have happened in the last um, two weeks. Some pretty major ones. I mean, making uh, the 2016 preview available. They just opened that bad boy right up and made it available, which is awesome. I'm very glad that they did. Um, and then putting out the Matter Center, so finding a solution that they've been working on with partners and using it themselves and then making it available. Um, very, very good for the legal community and showing how they can use those tools. And so as they have to start using these tools, I think we're going to start to see a better set of tools um, when they have to use them and they have to work with them. So. Um, we're really excited to see what uh, comes of that, and like I said, I'm going to try to dig in and see um, see what I can find. But a lot of times, as of lately, they put big blog posts out, but then it tends to be several weeks before they actually uh, make it available or something like that. So all things that I'm uh, looking into as we go. So we will keep looking for that. Um, the next thing that we have are some case studies. Now, I just list these here uh, just so you guys can look at them and see. Sometimes they're really interesting to look at. I, I was looking at this first one, and I just kind of laughed uh, because um, I know some global IT managers. Um, yeah, as a global IT manager, I need to be able to react quickly from wherever I'm at, be it on the slopes, the trails, or the beach. Uh, <laughs> I, what I love about this is manager. Can I do that job? Yeah. I want to to the trail <laughs> beach. Yeah, I I love it. It was kind of like okay, okay. So you're getting customer queries while you're surfing and skiing, and hiking, and this is just I mean, but it's so true because they're a sporting goods store. So yeah, probably their uh, IT manager maybe is doing all of those things. But I just looked at it and I was like. Not sure that that's really going to relate to everybody, but maybe it will. It was kind of funny. So um, I thought dream. that one. Yeah, yeah. We can all dream that I can answer all of my questions from the beach, 
with a drink in my hands. Of course, he's probably not, like, he's only got water in his hand, and he's, like, surfing. He's not doing what I would do on the beach. But, um, and on the slopes, I'd probably just be sitting in the uh, lodge. <laughs> let's, let's be honest. Looking at the beautiful mountain, uh, probably not skiing. So, yeah. Okay, so I'll never be the IT manager for an athletic company. Big shocker. But, uh, but that was pretty cool what they did with Office 365. And then the other one, I think it's called Taste Tea. I'm not sure. It's a smoothie slash tea place uh, from California. Pretty small company, but they are expanding with franchises. And they had been uh, doing Dropbox and Google Docs and different things like that with their employees. And they realized pretty quickly that that wasn't a... Um, that wasn't a solution that could carry on as they expanded and so they went uh, full into Office 365 and they're looking at doing everything from inventory management all the way to communications and different things like that inside of Office 365. So pretty interesting story, a uh, pretty interesting story there. Um, okay, so Michelle Warfield had a question for us and she said, uh, is the Matter Center a Microsoft-based uh, solution area? So it shows up on the legal, if you go into uh, the Microsoft website and look under legal resources, it's a solution that they're pushing, um, that they're pushing there. So like I said, I haven't torn apart all of the pieces, but I'm pretty sure it's designed very specific uh, for a case management type solution right now, but it is all based off of uh, Microsoft technologies using the basics of SharePoint and stuff like that. I'm assuming it's one of those things that you could take and then apply to other, um, apply it to other uh, silos and verticals of information, but for right now it's, it's geared very much towards uh, legal companies and they worked with two or three other legal companies to put all of the information out there. So, uh, a bit interesting, but whatever they're going to do with something like that, they're going to apply it to healthcare or apply it to schools or, you know, the same types of things. And so, um, I really like to see them go with solution-based stuff because then they can focus in on something, really understand it, and then if they have to run their own legal department on it, I love it that LCA is running off to, you know, after that because it means then it's working because they're not going to sacrifice their performance for what they need in order, you know, because the tools don't match. So the tools are going to be updated to work with that. So very interesting, um, very interesting stuff there. So awesome. Thank you, Michelle, for the question. Um, Let's see. So our next thing is, yay, a day in the life of Tasha. Um, I love it. I put the bowl pitcher in there twice because I just think the bowl pitcher is just fun. <laughs> I did say it's probably the most me picture that is in existence. That's that's me in a nutshell. So what's bowl. the story of the bowl pitcher? Where, where did this pitcher get snapped? Were you purposely putting a bowl on your head? I actually did not put the bowl on my head, uh, my bowl on my head, and we were cooking. We're quite the, the team in the kitchen. Um, both of us love to cook, and I'm a, so um, it just so happened that, I don't know, in the process of making a thing, bowl ended up on my head, and a picture got taken of it. <laughs> I love it, um, because it makes me, whenever I see it, it makes me realize how fun you are, and I just love it. I think it's, it's the same way, like, uh, whenever I see a minion, I think of Tom Duff, and I just love it. Yeah. So I, I just love it. There's certain things I associate with people. So I'm pretty sure every time I see a red bull, I'm going to be like, I bet if Tasha were here, she'd put that on her head. But I've changed but, that profile picture like three times, and every time I change it, there's like a public outcry of where is the bull. <laughs> it's probably going to be my avatar for a while. It, it works. It works for you. Red bulls yeah. look great on you. It's just Thanks. you wear it well. <laughs> They get their girlfriend a hat like that, and I said William Sonoma. <laughs> That's kind of awesome. Maybe you could make a collection of hats, and then you could sit on the beach with your drinks. My bowl forever. hat. Yeah, there you go. Okay. <laughs> well, um, I would love for you to kind of give us a little bit of background about um, you and what does your daily life look like. I know you're working right now on a lot with project servers so I would love uh, for you to kind of share that perspective with us what is it what is a day um, <laughs> what is a day in Tanya's life like and what are some of the struggles you face and the things you have to work through 
Um, so, being a, a SharePoint consultant, um, a lot of there's a, there's like the well known story from people who do SharePoint of how they got into SharePoint, and it's always that one day I was um, magically told, "Here you go, here's SharePoint. This is, belongs to you now," and um, that's actually pretty much how I've gotten to start doing project server stuff. Um, I was in a role where I was um, doing project management e things. I actually even had to go get my PMP, um, but in a in a desire to remain technical, they asked me if I would also um, sort of administer their SharePoint or their project server, which actually lives um, on top of SharePoint. Um, and that was another reason why they asked, is because the relationship between the two products. You really can't have project server without SharePoint. Um, right. you know, if you didn't know that, now you know. Um, so I agreed, and what I didn't know is that that this meant that I would be completely um, doing everything for Project Server from the ground up, uh, from scratch, by myself. So um, not one to back away from a challenge. I <laughs> and uh, learned everything that I could about Project Server in the shortest period of time that I could. And at, at that time, it was Project Server 2010 um, that we were rolling out. So um, what's really interesting about Project Server is that it's really a middleman between SharePoint and Project Professional. A lot of people are familiar with Project Professional. Um, it's an incredibly powerful project management tool. Um, everybody has seen the very quintessential Gantt charts, little activity list and stuff, but it does, it, it is capable of doing a lot more than that. And um, one of the benefits of utilizing Project Server is that you can actually open up access to uh, the work in your project schedule to the project team members and allow them to report their time on a specific task directly within Project Server, and then that those entries are sort of, um, you know, coagulated together to to update the project schedule itself without allowing individuals access into your project schedule. Which, if there's anybody who has ever been in charge of a project professional schedule, the idea of letting anybody else into it <laughs> ever. You touch one thing, everything turns blue, you have no idea what just happened, and you have a very yep. big plan. So, um, yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, if you've been there, you're nodding and you're like wiping your. <laughs> your um, so, that was, that was the idea was that um, we needed the capability for team members to be able to report their time against specific activities um, so that we could do some earned value stuff. And um, right as I had gotten my Project Server 2010 install under wraps and ready to push to production, um, word came out that Project Professional 2013 was being pushed to the desktops. And for those of you who don't know, Project Professional 2013 has zero compatibility with Project Server 2010. So you have to upgrade to Project Server 2013. Um, and to order to in order to upgrade to Project Server 2013, you have to upgrade to SharePoint 2013, and this all sounds really like old tech to probably a number of people on the on the line or on the webinar. But um, being a consultant for a government agency, sometimes um, it takes that that kind of a critical uh, change to really get the infrastructure up to speed with what what the clients have. Um, so that's what I've been doing every day for like the last, <laughs> and um, really the part that's that's the key is there are definitely some some difficulties in doing your project server installation things that are difficult. Like there's probably anybody out there who's done this kind of install knows that. Um, your OLAP cube that is the item that's used for reporting in both 2010 and 2013, if, if there's anybody out there that's had that thing build correctly the first time, you are a hero and you deserve a medal because it's just not possible. Um, a very smart person once said uh, that if you have problems, and this is for SharePoint too, this is actually in a SharePoint talk, that if something is wrong, 
99% of the time it's permissions related. And I'm here to tell you that extends to project server, it extends <laughs> to SQL, because that connection between project server and SQL is a dark mystery. And it really it can be there. If you had your OLAP cube not built correctly or your SharePoint server um, isn't talking to your SQL server right, it's really a challenge. And it's hard to find support out there for it. I've been very, very thankful um, to be on Twitter as, as you and I are. The real, the real boon of Twitter when you're part of a professional community is other people in that professional community are there too. So you have a place where you can ask questions and get some help. And um, Prasanna Adavi is awesome. That man has helped me a great deal. And he's actually running a, uh, a virtual project conference. It's the first one of its type. It's online. It's free. Very cool. Um, it's happening next month, October 22nd. So if you want to go register, it's um, uh, projectvirtualconference.com. And it's 24 hours of project projecty goodness. Are you so, giving any sir uh, any sessions or anything there, Tasha? Oh no, I'll be listening in though, because <laughs> um, like I said, it's it's really hard to find project um, information online. And and coming from a SharePoint world, that's that's a challenge because there's so much good SharePoint um, resource out resources out there. If you have a problem, you really you can just Google it and find the answer. And sometimes it's not necessary when it comes to uh, project stuff. It can be all very, very deployment specific, how your place um, is set up in terms of authentication, in terms of um, how, how you're even going to deploy projects specifically for your organization. Are you only going to have one instance of a PWA site? Are you going to have one for your um, departments. So how you set it up um, is very specific to your organization. So it makes it a challenge, I think, for people to um, share something that can be applied broadly. Or maybe it makes them afraid to share something because they think it's too specific to their right. their organization. So they don't feel like anyone would get any anything out of it. Or maybe they feel like they can't share it. Yeah. So. Um, the fact that there is such a conference that's going to happen gives me a lot of joy um, because I think having a spirit of sharing is is really needed, especially in that space. Oh, very cool. Yeah. Uh, so what is one thing that has been the most painful lesson about Project Server that you have learned over the last couple of years that you've been digging in? Just one lesson that you look back and be like, man, I learned a lot, but did that ever be painful. It's got to be that um, your authentication between your your SharePoint server and your SQL server and having that stuff connect correctly so that your reporting works and your, your queue builds and it's just terrible. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> you come home and have a glass of wine a number of times yeah. and, and actually in the Project Server 2013 um, install Recently, the, of course, the user profile service didn't provision correctly the first time, and oh. so get it. It was that was another day. I came home and had a glass of wine. Uh, I am with you. I'm with you. Okay. Yeah. What if? Okay. So let's say there's another SharePoint admin out there, or someone that's uh, getting ready to ask their administrator to install it because they're really interested in using the project server features. What are you know a couple of pieces of advice, maybe one to three pieces of advice that you would give them as they're undertaking this next adventure? Um, definitely join the community and get, join it. You're going to want some commiseration at a minimum. <laughs> necessarily get help. You're going to want to feel like you're not alone and you're not insane and you're not the only one going through these difficulties. Um, honestly, um, I a good client uh, here because she and I both have a shared, um, <laughs> shared love project server and we have like, you know, project Tasha one or project one Tasha zero or she had a SharePoint 
one domain zero day the other day. So we, we share our, our battles. Um, and also, you know, get, just don't ever give up. There's going to be times where you really feel like this is insane. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. There's a meme out there that shows like a golden retriever sitting in front of a computer just sort of like, and I feel like that regularly, like the like a dog sitting in front of a computer, like I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, so don't give up and don't be afraid to, to look dumb and ask the dumb questions because honestly your question probably isn't dumb. Right. There are a lot of people out there that have had that same problem. They can direct you to a place that while it might not be the exact answer you're looking for, gives you some insight into the answer that you're looking for and can, an can help you on your, on your journey to figure out what it is you need to figure out. So uh, Michelle has a question for us, and she said, if you had an Office 365 corporate intranet and a project online PWA mm -hmm. um, environment, are there any recommendations or considerations or anything that you can share that you know about that type of setup? So I know for project, um, project the Office 365 version of project, I, I guess I can't call it project server because it's not a server. I think um, it's Project Online, maybe. Project Online. Um, there's, there's a lot of things that you can't do. Any, any of the stuff that's server-side stuff in Project Server, you can't do in Project Online. Um, and that, I think, can pose a challenge, because the stuff that's specific to your PWA site that you can do within a PWA um, is... is not nearly as rich or as granular as the kind of integration you can get between project professional and um, and an on-premises installation of project uh, server. So probably your biggest challenge is going to be if you have that person in your organization, use project professional at a at a pretty like advanced level or even we'll just say medium level they're going to be used to functionality that they can't leverage in in the online version and i think that can be that can be a challenge do they have alternate uh, reporting mechanisms or anything like that like using any of the bi stack or does it cross out yet do you know of, of anything around that or i honestly i i don't know because the the reporting stuff in project server is stuff that you set up on the server side so i'm really I'm, of how that reporting structure is for, for Project Online. Yeah, and it's, it's interesting. I think, like, when we first started talking about Office 365 versus on-prem, uh, mm -hmm. BI and reporting was one of those really big pieces that if you had to do a lot of it, you still really yeah. had to be on-prem. And I've yeah. seen it slowly go away from that, but I don't know that it's fully there. But I yeah. think it close, but I don't know that all the tools are there. So that would probably be an interesting thing. And, and then the other thing is that the thing that I've seen about Project Server, and this is just something I've seen as not somebody that's been intimately involved in the projects, but someone who's been, you know, working on and, and from that consulting from a strategic type perspective, there's a lot of people that, um, let's just, when you have, I think, you know, the statement is, is when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And mm -hmm. sometimes I need like a stapler and I'm taking this big old hammer and I'm hammering at it because that's what I have. So sometimes, you know, these reports and stuff like that, if you're not necessarily an advanced user, then the functionality that is available is, you know, might be okay for what you're trying to do. So all things to be considered and to look at and, and you know, different pieces. I think if you're using project to the level where you have a list of activities that you're tracking and you're using the Gantt chart, you're probably just A-OK, -okay, fine. Um, even if you're applying, re you know, resources at your sort of like what you would think of as standard level, like just 100% availability, that they're dedicated resource to your project. It's really um, users who um, have a need for advanced earned value metrics that yeah. are going to need to, um, they're going to need to consider pulling the data made out and calculating it a different way. Right. And, and I know there's some functionality in like the BI stack and different things like that that are now available. So is it automatically there? Is it not? And so I think it's, it's great. So if someone's got that online 
component, they should really be looking at what are our reporting requirements and how do we solve it giving our set of tools and if we can't, how do we get around it. So um, that's a really, really good, uh, good perspective. Um, okay, so this is one of my favorite questions that I love to ask um, everyone when I talk to them. Um, and I do have to say, Tasha, I actually gave you the questions beforehand today. I had yep. Kathy on my show several weeks ago, and I didn't give her the questions beforehand. Yep. And I just called her up, and we had her. And it was funny. She did really good with it, but I, I at least let you think about uh, some of these instead of putting you on the spot. But mm -hmm. if you look back over your entire career now, what is one thing that you wish you would have known when you started that you know now? So um, there's actually a, a quite famous blog post out there by a very, very smart man named Scott Hanselman about imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. And I wish I knew about imposter syndrome when I first started because I was terrified uh, to ask questions. I was terrified that I had no idea what I was doing, that I was dumb, and that anything that I could possibly be doing had to be wrong and that, you know, if any of you are familiar with imposter syndrome, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And it's a healthy thing to have, I, I really feel. Like, I've come to terms with my, my <laughs> imposter. Um, because you do, um, questioning yourself is, is really a strength. It's not a weakness. And it, it causes you to do a lot more research um, into your what you think is a good solution than maybe you would do if you didn't have that quality. Um, but at the same time, I think that it can hold you back if you're not willing to put yourself into a place where you're not comfortable and you know ask those questions to people that maybe sound dumb. Maybe you think I'm way new at this. Everyone is gonna let's just attack yeah. me. Because I'm a I'm a noob and um, but don't have that fear. Just ask the question. Be okay with looking a little ridiculous, obviously, with a bowl on my head. <laughs> really, honestly, that's, that's why I have a bowl on my head, because if I can put a picture of me with a bowl on my head on the Internet, I really I don't know how much more ridiculous I could, I could look. And now so I shouldn't even say that, because I'm going to jinx myself. Um, but yeah, so um, I just wish that I knew that it's okay to feel dumb. Ask the question anyway. I'm sure everything everything will work out fine. Everything's yeah. good. <laughs> I love it. I love that, and that kind of aligns to one other thing that I learned um, when I first started, and it kind of ties into that. Is not only is it okay to ask all the questions, it's okay to be a voice in the community because there's always somebody that's a step you know, behind you, where you've gone there. And so when I write a blog post, it's not for me to teach the most senior people who have done something. It's for me to teach my audience of where I'm at, and I'm okay with that. And everybody has a voice. And I remember when I first was really getting started and struggling and stuff like that, that was a piece of advice uh, that Andrew Connell actually gave me as we were passing. This was before we really... Um, really became good friends. I consider him right now an excellent friend. But before even that, and he just said, you know, Jen, he's like, you have a voice, and, and what you're saying matters to people, and get a blog, and get out there, and get started. And so it's kind of kind of ties into what you're saying, Tasha. You know, be able to ask the questions, but be, you know, engage in that community, because it's going to help make you a richer person, um, and it's also going to help uh, your experiences are going to be enlightened and become richer experiences as you go through these different changes. And so I, I love it. I think that's my favorite question to ask people when I get them on the show, because it's so neat to hear um, hear their responses and hear what they have to say. I love it, love it, love it. Okay, so we have just a couple of minutes left. So my last question for you is looking at the landscape of the world as it is now. What are some of the most exciting technologies for you right now? What kind of gets you the most geeked up and excited and like, man, I wish I had a project that would let me play with this type moment? Sure. Um, so those of you who, who know me know that I, I want to be a real dev when I grow up. 
and I'm I'm trying. Um, I have at home projects that I do to try to to learn as much as I can. And I was fortunate to be able to go to Ignite um, this past May. And one of the things that I, you just don't even know how excited I got about it was um, the Office 365 Unified API. And uh, yeah, it's uh, basically all the stuff that's in Office 365 is available to you as a developer. They're adding new things all the time, and it's available in one place, that API, where you can call like stuff from uh, Exchange and stuff from Azure AD and stuff from SharePoint and put together, you know, if, if you really your imagination is yeah. is the limit of how you can put that stuff together and present it to the user in a way that people like people get work done. And I'm I'm excited for that space to continue to grow. It's a little new, but there's a lot there for how new it is. And um, the whole as a as a like connection to that the whole spirit of openness that Microsoft is putting out there, that stuff, that, that unified API in connection with the patterns and practices um, information that they're putting out there, and they just un, um, unveiled like the Office UI fabric, um, yeah, which I is like the Office version of Bootstrap, if you're familiar with, with that. Um, and all that stuff's available on GitHub, so anybody can anybody can go and look at it and learn the Microsoft recommended ways to do uh, your Office app that has a look and feel, um, you know, the same look and feel that all, all the Office Online and Office 365 stuff already has, just by using their own tools that they're putting out there available for public use. And it's a great place for someone like me to to learn and join in and get up to speed um, in a way that everybody else is sort of getting up to speed too. So even though I'm new, I'm just a little more new than everybody else. Okay? So I'm I'm really excited about that space. I've I've had an app that I'm working been working on for a long time. Um, as a as a SharePoint person, I've been in the forms and workflow space for a while yeah. and. I want to graduate to being able to build add-ins for SharePoint. Using those tools, I feel like there's a lot of opportunity for me, and that's what gets me like that's what gets me excited. I love it. And for those that might be interested in that, Eric just posted a link. I guess uh, Scott Hiller and, and uh, Richard Deserga did a show on that just yesterday, um, mm -hmm. and they kind of talked through that. So he put the link out there in the all audience section, so you guys can see that and get a link to that show if you guys want to dive in. Um, and get more information. And um, Richard is on the team at Microsoft that actually uh, builds that and manages that and maintains that. And so that's another example of going straight to the source um, where we're pulling that information. So really good content. Well, it looks like we are wrapping up today's show. Tasha, thank you so much uh, for coming on and joining us. It was a joy to get to chat with you. I love it. I love being able to have um, have you out here just get to hear um, different perspectives about everything. I will close out by showing uh, the link to the Yammer group. So this is the Office 365 Yammer network. Uh, Microsoft is very active in this group. They are very supportive of having um, everyone in there giving feedback, doing comments, all of that. They will respond to you. So it is a great group um, to join that network and, and get and engage with that information. And then um, I think the only other announcement I have is that the next show that we have um, is in two weeks, um, so two two weeks from today. And Corey is going to come back on the show and uh, be my guest, and he's going to give us an update of Windows 10. So Windows 10 has been out in the wild now um, for a little bit. We want to talk about you know what are the lessons that have been learned as Windows 10 has been out there. What is it like? Um, to do those deployments now? Are there gotchas that we should be aware of? Um, when should a company start jumping in and looking at some of these Windows 10 pieces? So we'll start off the show just like we did today and give you know a high-level update of everything that has uh, launched in the last two weeks um, from Office, uh, Office blogs and kind of going through those different pieces and then we'll kind of wrap up um, with Corey and talking about Windows 10 and giving an update. So that's what we have. Thank you guys so much for coming. This was super fun. Tasha, I loved having you. I hope you'll come I hope you'll come back and join us again because it was super fun. Um, I loved what you shared. Very insightful and I appreciate it. 
uh, appreciate you being our guest so very much. Thanks. All right, guys. With that, we are out. Have a great day, everybody. Bye.